Good morning, everybody. I uh, hope you're well. Welcome to the last uh, class before we uh, break for the Thanksgiving recess. Uh, I hope you're all well. I know this has uh, been a stressful se semester, and this time of year is always a particularly stressful time, so I wish you all the best with uh, all the various responsibilities you're juggling. Um, <clears throat> any questions about interim video one? Um, between now and the end of the semester, you're mostly spending your time on implementing uh, an idea of your own into your ASL educational uh, system. All good? Okay, so uh, let's talk briefly now about uh, interim video two, um, which is a little different from previous years. Uh, let's see here. Uh, interim video two, yeah. So uh, as I as as I explained last time, interim video one. This is you just starting to demonstrate whatever idea you have for additional functionality. And the grad students, you're adding in the the secondary hand navigation. Interim video two. What we used to do in previous years is you do some uh, testing to see how intuitive your system is for your dorm mate, a friend or two, or some family members. Usually, you would do this over the the Thanksgiving break. Um, however, in order to try and support social distancing, no testing uh, this week. Instead, you're going to be using uh, the lower left panel, which I think for most of you is still uh, is still free. In the lower left panel, you're going to be uh, including two visualizations this week. The first one is going to allow the user to see uh, how their performance is progressing from one session to the next. So they log in uh, at one point, they start to use your system, they leave, they come back, they log in again, and as they're progressing through their second uh, session, how are they doing performance-wise relative to how they did in their previous session? Uh, again, in the spirit of the interim videos here, it's up to you uh, how you want to visualize or how you want to help the user understand their progress relative to previous sessions. When you create that visualization, as usual, you'll be shooting a visual, uh, shooting a video of that visualization in action, and also write down a sentence or two for us directly into Blackboard so we get an idea about how this visualization is supposed to work. Then you're adding in, uh, then you're going to be adding in a second visualization in the same lower left panel, which is showing how the user's performance compares to those of others. So you can create a, a high score table or, or some other progress, uh, some other progress visualization, competition visualization. Uh, it's up to you. And then same thing, you'll be shooting, uh, you'll be shooting a video. Hold on a second. You'll be shooting another video of this second visualization and showing us how uh, and showing us how you'll be shooting a second visualization, uploading it to uh, YouTube, and then writing a sentence or two to describe uh, that visualization. You'll notice in step H here it mentioned it mentions including the submission of three written descriptions that's left over from last year. That's meant to be two written descriptions. One for your first visualization, second for your second visualization. I'll clean this up, uh, I'll clean this typo up after class. Any questions about that? It should be pretty straightforward. Okay. Okay, and as usual, it's due, uh, it's due on, on Monday, so if you want a, a Thanksgiving break, it might be a good thing to tackle uh, today or tomorrow and get it out of the way so you can focus, uh, focus on your, your break. Okay. So uh, back to lecture, uh, we are about to finish lecture 23, which is our last uh, lecture in this long series, uh, this long theme of looking outward, stitching technology gradually into the world, where that technology is directly sensing and acting upon the world. We uh, looked at robotics in, uh, last week. We looked at robots interacting with humans, where the particular kind of expectations that social robots and humans interacting with social robots should have. And then we ended last time by talking about a robot swarm. So they are pushing against the world and observing how the world pushes back, but they are also pushing literally and figuratively against each other and observing the sensory repercussions of those collective 
actions. We looked at a uh, we looked at a lot of different kinds of uh, collective robotic systems last time. We looked at swarms. We looked at uh, modular robots that can reconfigure. And I left you last time with a thought exercise, which was how might you deploy a swarm of robots to a disaster site where the physical context is very important here. We're dealing with uh, irregularly sized uh, rubble, which means irregularly sized tunnels and apertures uh, that the robot must navigate. Uh, other physical context is because uh, it is unlikely that there is going to be Wi-Fi or internet connectivity throughout this uh, space, so the robots are going to have to communicate with one another uh, in some way. So uh, I left you with a few questions to think about. Um, while I'm finishing talking, please feel free to type into chat your ideas about what your robot swarm might look like um, for this problem and how that swarm is designed to deal with the particular physical context of a disaster site. I left on this slide uh, a, a, a simpler question, which is if you just had modular robots and you wanted them to climb stairs, how might they reconfigure to do so? So this is, this is a much simpler problem if this seems a little bit overwhelming. But I'll give you a minute to, to reabsorb this question from last time. And if you have some ideas, go ahead and type them into chat and we'll see what you came up with. Henry says, a robot swarm that connects themselves in a chain and continues to do this until they find someone. Exactly. So uh, if we imagine modular robots, they might want to stay physically connected with one another. Uh, conforming into a one-dimensional chain probably makes sense. Uh, to do this until they find someone, then the chain can be used as a sort of breadcrumb trail. Exactly. So, so breadcrumb navigation or breadcrumb communication uh, is a common technique in these kinds uh, of scenarios where the robots themselves may stay at intermittent locations along a path and be both uh, a receiver and transmitter of signals coming from deeper uh, in the site. The task here is to locate human survivors. Um, it, deep within a debris field like this, there is little light um, and there are little, a few signals that would be useful for some of the Breitenberg's vehicles we saw before. If you are a robot deep inside this debris field, imagine you're a, a, simply a Breitenberg vehicle. If we set aside the collective robotics question for a moment, what are some of the signals that you might be uh, looking for to help you locate human survivors? Remember the aggressor that was able to turn and move towards signal I was able to turn. I was able to turn towards and move towards light. Uh, in the case of the aggressor, what would be the substitute for light here? What what signal might be given off that the robot uh, the robot would respond to? Any ideas? So as Joseph says, uh, sound, in particular the sound of human voices, may be, particular, uh, may be particularly uh, important. Uh, clearly, in this situation, it is important to locate human survivors as quickly as possible. Assuming that we are trying to design robots that are uh, first responders, and assuming that, that those robot first responders do locate, uh, do locate a human survivor, Khan says heat, exactly, so body temperature may be important as well. What is the first thing that a, that a robot human uh, robot uh, first responder should supply to a human uh, to a human survivor trapped in the rubble? This is thinking now very carefully about the the physical uh, context of this situation. 
if you're a designer of this robot swarm and one of your robots actually does manage to locate a human survivor, what is the first thing that that robot should do? Absolutely. So Joseph mentions water. Uh, I have a roboticist colleague uh, at Tufts University who works on soft robotics, which we won't talk about uh, in this course. Um, that, uh, in, in their lab at Tufts, they're working on basically robot uh, water bottles. So a soft, deformable, cylindrical robot that is able to squeeze through and move through the rubble and use, as uh, Henry was mentioning, the uh, breadcrumb trail idea as well, uh, to spread out and communicate, provide a mesh communication inside. And if one of these soft robots uh, finds the human survivors, they follow uh, heat, as Khan mentioned, and carbon dioxide given off by the exhalation of breath from the human survivor to move towards the mouth of the survivor and supply uh, water. It's one of the, the uh, more interesting and, and one of the more difficult uh, problems to think about uh, as a potential application for robotics, but you could imagine in these situations that a collective of robot robots, small robots, might be able to penetrate and provide first responder uh, services to uh, human survivors. Okay. So uh, that concludes our discussion on collective robotics and our discussion on looking outward. And we're going to finish this course uh, in, the, in the last four lectures by inverting the problem and quote unquote looking inward. So we're going to start today by talking about uh, virtual reality. We'll talk uh, next week about augmented reality, where instead of the technology moving out into the physical world, we are trying to draw a human into a virtual world. We will also then look literally at inwardness of technology, where the technology is marching literally inward towards us. We'll talk in lecture 26 and 27 about wearable technology, so interactive technologies that are on the skin, and cyborg technologies which are placed under the skin. Okay, so uh, we'll start with virtual and augmented reality. Just to distinguish between the two of these, obviously they're familiar technologies, you know the distinction between them. But from the point of view of HCI design, in the case of virtual reality, we are trying to replace as many features of the physical world as possible that the, that the human pushes against and senses the sensory re repercussions of that action. Right. So, uh, so for example, in a head-mounted display, a, a, a human observer turns their head. They expect, given all decades of experience from the physical world, that when you turn your head to the right, everything in your visual field flows to the left. Right. That is a, a very common uh, feature, one of the most important features of visual perception. We're going to re re replace the physical visual field. The user is not going to be able to see the world around them and we're going to place it with we're going to replace it with a virtual scene. But how their movement influences what they see in that virtual scene is going to be replaced with virtual reality software. So throughout the VR discussion, I want you to keep in mind this idea of replacement. We're removing a sensor motor loop that the user expects with the physical world and replacing it as best we can with the same loop, but now with a virtual, a virtual environment rather than a physical environment. In augmented reality, as the name implies, instead of replacing sensor motor uh, loops, we're going to augment them. We're going to add additional visual and auditory and possibly tactile cues that the user can trigger when they move and sense the repercussions of those actions. Yeah? So replacement and augmentation. Okay. All right, so uh, virtual reality, obviously um, this idea has been around for a while, but it's only in the last few years that VR has started to become a practical reality and its obvious uh, main application uh, is gaming. Uh, as most of you know, uh, games or esports are now an incredibly, uh, incredibly large sector uh, of the economy. This is a, a link to a, a report on uh, virtual reality and games from last year, 2019. The beginning of 2019, this report predicted uh, that gamers would spend $152 billion 
on games and there would be two and a half billion gamers last year. You can imagine with uh, the pandemic and, and people spending a lot more time at home, this number is probably much, much higher this year. For comparison, if you look at the second most lucrative uh, sector of the entertainment uh, economy, it's uh, uh, box office, which obviously this year is close to zero. Last year in 2019, the most popular uh, movie grossed less than a billion. If you visually uh, estimate, or, uh, estimate the sum of the top 10 uh, movies from 2019, it doesn't come anywhere close to $150 billion. So the gaming industry has far surpassed the economic clout of uh, uh, the box office. So there's a huge market. At the moment, the majority of games obviously are not set in virtual reality. They're set in virtual worlds, but the user has uh, little, uh, there is little replacement of the physical world with the virtual world in those games, but that's coming. So, um, in order to make virtual reality a practical reality, um, there are some significant technological challenges to overcome first, hardware challenges followed by software challenges. So we're going to start with some of the emerging technologies that are being created that help the user, that, that try and replace sensor motor expectations from the real world and match those expectations when the user is interacting with the virtual world as well. So I'm going to play a short YouTube video now. In this video, it's a little bit of a promotional video, but they're going to introduce these five uh, these five different hardware platforms that are uh, designed to try and support virtual reality. For each one of them, I want you to mark down pros and cons of those technologies from the point of view of an HCI designer. Pros in the sense of which of them meet sensor motor expectations. So for example, if you're wearing a heads-up display, you move your head to the right, the scene should move to the left. That would meet the sensor motor expectations. However, if that movement to the left has a little bit of a lag in it, that can be very disorienting for the observer. Uh, obviously, in reality, when you move your head to the right, the, your, the visual scene immediately shifts to the left. There is no lag. So that lag that exists in some VR systems uh, frustrates sensor motor expectations. Right? It, it, it uh, frustrates the prediction of your mental model, which is, if I move my head this way, my visual scene should move in the opposite way. Make sense? Okay, some of these uh, some of these meeting and frustrating sensor motor expectations are going to be more obvious than others in the video. Some are a little more subtle, so uh, note them down, and then when the video ends, we'll we'll go through each one in turn and see what you came up with. Today we're checking out VR treadmills that are either currently on the market or under development. These devices add locomotion to the VR experience, designed to increase immersion. Let's check them out. Catwalk is a new omnidirectional treadmill input device. The main problem Catwalk solves is to move within a small space in reality and achieve limitless and continuous movement in virtual reality. With its built-in and wearable sensors, you can literally walk, run, backwards, jump, crouch, and sit in the virtual world. Different games call for different movements. Catwalk allows you to switch actions anytime you want. You can even sit down to drive or fly when a game requires it. We started the project since 2013, and we have made quite a bit of prototypes. During developing and testing, we noticed that in many games, you want to perform different actions with your arms and legs. It was annoying and disappointing if these movements are constrained. And while in a virtual world, you can't see the real one. If there are devices near your arms and legs, you may hit something or get hurt. The Creative Catwalk Independent Support Structure and Open Construction set your arms and legs free. First, it is very easy to get in. Without a ring or column surrounding you, you can move freely and securely without constraint or worry about hitting anything. You can swing your arms naturally or put your hands to rest down by your sides, getting closer to a natural walk posture. 
catwalk has not just simply removed the column and the ring. Our unique design can limit the horizontal moving range and control the vertical movement function while walking and running. It can automatically provide 35 cm vertical moving range while jumping, crouching, and sitting. Meanwhile, it can help users move back to center to adjust the position offset while walking, which can increase the sense of balance and safety. When we walk in real life, friction is what propels us forward. Frictionless walking is awkward, like walking on ice, if you must pay attention to keep balance. Catwalk uses high friction material surface and uses a constant force of rolling friction to simulate real walking forces and human motion. This makes you feel like you are walking on real ground instead of sliding walk. With normal friction, it is easier to keep balance and it will decrease the time it takes anyone to learn to use catwalk. Catwalk uses a lower cambered base to transfer potential energy to kinetic energy and to reproduce the movement locus. All of this is to achieve a more natural feeling of walking. You can use it to enjoy relaxing virtual reality games or applications in a comfortable way. Just sit back and relax. Our software can transfer body motion to keyboard or gamepad. This means all the games with keyboard or gamepad support will be playable. We are also developing our own SDK and demo to achieve analog movement and independent walking and looking direction. The prototype you see here is kind of big. This was made to prove our brand new solution. We already have all the plans to make it smaller and lighter. Okay, I think we'll actually do each of these one at a time, a little bit easier that way. And again, as promised, it's a little bit promotional, but other than that, what are some of the uh, pros and cons of the, the catwalk system here? What are the various actions that the user can perform in this system? And what sensory repercussions of those actions make sense, and which are a little bit different from what you would receive in reality? Obviously, walking and displacement, one of the most difficult things to support in VR. As Robert says, your body does not move forward when walking. The fluids in your ears pick up on this and it feels off. Exactly. So if you've ever run on a treadmill, you have this experience. That an important part of walking is actually the acceleration and deceleration of your body. There is oscillation clearly in the system. Your body is oscillating in phase or in, is moving as you move, but it's not quite the same acceleration signal you would expect. So Robert, you're right, your inner ear detects a little, that something is a little bit different. What else is slightly different? You also can't perceive inclines with this, right? So there'd be no way to support the illusion of climbing up or down stairs or up or down ramps. There actually is an incline. If you look, if you notice the, uh, the platform is a little bit uh, concave. Why? Why the concavity? So to help you move in place. So obviously if you step up onto the lip of the concavity, there are these rollers on the bottom of the shoes for this system. You are slowly sliding back down or rolling back down towards the center. They spent a bit of time actually talking about the rollers on these, on these shoes. What was, the, what was the point about the rollers? Robert says, uh, because your hips are fixed so to stay touching the ground, you have to move uh, the ground closer. Robert, I'm not quite sure I understand your point here. Can you rephrase it for us? While Robert is doing that, what's, what's the point of these high friction rollers they mentioned? This is a subtlety of the sensor motor uh, loops associated with walking that we're not always aware of.
So to make it feel that your feet aren't, aren't sliding, right? Not surprisingly, if you're walking and you feel your feet sliding out from under you, that's a very upsetting feeling, which is usually a good sign. You're either on, on ice or loose gravel and you're about to fall. Um, so that can be not just a frustrating, but an upsetting or scary sensation in a virtual reality system. The rollers are meant to try and minimize that, that feeling. Uh, Nolan says to simulate the friction your foot has on the ground, exactly, make you feel that you're pushing off the ground. An important part of that feel of friction or the resistance of your foot against the ground, that feeling of resistance is part of the signal that your brain is looking for to make sure that you are actually moving in the opposite direction, you're moving forward, right? So resistance due to uh, friction because of backward pushing against the ground means in reality usually forward displacement, but they're trying to minimize forward displacement here without having to get rid of that sensation of, of friction. Right? Okay. Uh, if you, Robert says, if you fully extend your leg and keep your body in the same place when moving your leg, you trace a curve. Yeah, exactly, right? So there's something also about the arc, uh, the arc traced by your foot during walking. Uh, in the game, if you look in the, those virtual environments, usually it's, it's flat ground, but in the catwalk, you're always walking inside of a concave. So there is another sensor motor loop that is frustrated by this system, which is that as you place your uh, swing foot, which is your foot that's up in the ground, up uh, uh, above the ground, as that foot decrease, is declining, your brain is actually making a prediction, your mental model is making a prediction at exactly what point in time your foot will feel contact with the ground if you see a flat plane. If you're walking up steps, your mental model makes a different prediction about when your descending foot is gonna come into contact with the ground. Um, you've probably all had the experience of walking up or down stairs and you miss, uh, you miss a stair and you, and you suddenly catch your breath because your mental model's prediction is not being met. In the catwalk system, your foot always hits that, that lip of the incline half a second or a few milliseconds earlier than your brain tells you it should because your brain is seeing a flat ground. So again, not perfect, and all virtual reality systems are gonna have to strike a very careful balance between what expectations can be met with what technology and which, what, depending on those technological choices, some aspects of sensor motor coordination is going to be frustrating. Okay, so, uh, so no, uh, one of the, the other things that was nice is no occlusions. They mentioned the sensor bar, uh, you can sit, there's relatively no lag in the system, but there are a lot of sensor motor uh, features of walking that are not supported by this uh, system. Okay, let's look at the next one. It's a big week for us. This week we delivered the first Omni. Yeah. It's kind of where games have always been trying to take you. They always talk about immersion and trying to actually put you in the game. Well, you can't just do that with only a console and a controller and a TV. It is immersive, but yet you know you're still sitting on a couch. Hopping on something like the Omni, where it just it puts you in the game when you, it's like you're suited enough to get into the battle. I have an extremely bad problem motivating myself to do exercise. Yeah, I broke a sweat in like that short amount of time. It's because you get the heat turned up in here, I don't know. Getting to enjoy that physical interaction of running and moving and looking and not feel so detached from the world that you're playing in. It's night and day. I have told people for years, if I could walk across Skyrim, I'd be more fit. And this is exactly that, that machine. I was like, oh my God, somebody actually made that thing. 
I mean, I'm not much of a shooter. I just want to go explore a world, go running in, you know, a world full of dragons and magicians and whatever. The biggest thing right off the bat is the lack of sickness. So far, all of my experiences with seated VR, like I have motion sickness stuff, and I had none of that here. What I loved about it is you're actually playing with people. The last demo I tried was single player, and you kind of walk through this uh, corridor, whereas this one was a little bit more wild because I had a partner there right next with me. When the bad guys get close to you, you instinctively, like, you move your body away from them. You react. My head moved, and it moved, and my whole body went with it, and it was cool. I could have this in my living room with my rock band equipment, and I think that's really exciting. Okay, very similar system to the catwalk, but some, some slight differences. Anyone notice what they were? They mentioned the lack of motion sickness here. Why, why do a lot of these systems induce motion sickness? I think we discussed this uh, a few weeks back. Your body has a lot of expectations, again, about acceleration due to the inner ear. When those expectations are frustrated for a lot of people, that induces, uh, that induces uh, motion sickness. Right at the beginning of this video of, of the Omni system, there was someone who was actually running at much higher speed than is po possible in the catwalk system, because in the case of the Omni, you're wearing a harness and it supports you a little bit. So you're getting one, some feedback in this system which frustrates sensor motor expectation, which is that you're being held by something where your brain is telling you, at least from the visual sense, you're in a free and clear uh, environment. That might help to support the, the slight differences between reality and virtual reality that induce uh, motion sickness, so you, f you might feel a little bit more secure. I haven't tried these systems, so it's hard to know exactly what the subjective uh, sense is here. Like, uh, like, the, like the catwalk system, they're using this concave uh, platform to walk in. Um, they do have this sensor bar, so there's a little bit of, uh, or this harness, so there's a little bit of occlusion. When your, your hand uh, is moving, it comes into contact with the bar uh, and so on. No, no sitting in this case. Okay, let's look at the third system. The virtualizer consists uh, of three main parts. Uh, the base plate with a low friction surface, uh, the pillars and the ring construction. There are linear guides in the pillars that allow for smooth and quiet vertical movements. This is necessary for crouching and jumping. And in addition to that, the ring construction allows the user to turn around and rotate 360 degrees. We felt that rotating inside of the second prototype wasn't as smooth as we wanted it to be, so we decided to improve the mechanism of the ring construction. Furthermore, we also refined the sensor system that detects the rotation of the user. We've also changed the linear guide system inside the pillars, which is now smoother, more quiet and more durable. On top of that, the new system is lighter than the previous one, so we have saved some weight. Um, another major improvement is the material that we use now on the base plate. For us it is very important to have natural walking and running inside the device. So the friction coefficient is now on a level which is ideal for natural movements. Um, when we started developing the virtualizer, we made some experiments with different shapes and also made a motion analysis in the laboratory. And we've also uh, tested the different shapes in action and we've realized that the flat base delivers the best immersion. Now if you use uh, a bowl shape, your feet will touch the slope of the bowl earlier than you would expect, creating a discrepancy between what you see and what you feel. And this breaks immersion and pulls you back into, the, into reality. Stability is very important for us, so we decided to use three pillars instead of two or just one. 
The reason is that three pillars absorb the forces and the momentum caused by the user better than two or just one pillar. Okay. And since you're able to sit down in the virtualizer, uh, we have to make sure that the construction supports the user's weight. Okay. Um, speaking of the sitting function, obviously you have to be fixated inside the ring um, to perform moves like uh, jumping and crouching and also of course to sit down. Does the user have to carry all the weight of the ring construction as well while he does so, or do you have a solution for that as well? Um, we have a special construction in the pillars, in the linear guides, okay. which compensates the whole weight of the ring construction, so the user doesn't have to carry the weight and doesn't feel anything of the ring construction. Okay, so one thing you notice about the new prototype is that you've constructed a black bar, which is hanging above your head now. Could you maybe explain the reason for it being there? Sure, yes, we call this black bar V-arm and it is constructed because of head-mounted displays and earphones which are wired. Okay. So you can guide the cables over your head and don't get disturbed in the virtual world. Okay. And it is designed that way that you can still aim upwards without tossing against it. I see, so it's for completely unrestricted movement. Absolutely. Okay, I see. Okay, Nunja, I think that's enough for now. Thank you for taking your time off to show us the virtualizer. You're welcome. Well. Okay, quick pros and cons. Quick pros and cons of uh, the virtualizer. So they've got rid of the bowl and gone back to the flat plate for the reason we've mentioned already. Other ideas? What are some of the obvious and not so obvious uh, frustrations of sensor motor expectations in this system? or other design decisions that actually support more of your sensor motor expectations with, in your interaction with the physical environment. Exactly, so minimizing occlusion, which is a good one. Um, Sarah says they had uh, the three sides or those three pillars with the three bars to help with momentum. So you're wearing that, that bar, which is obviously restricting your movement and you could potentially feel the weight of it. So they were trying to compensate in the pillars by moving that ring with you. But if you watch carefully in the video, you'll notice that the, the ring, there's a little bit of a delay obviously because it needs to sense the acceleration or the movement of the body and then move the ring accordingly. Presumably you can feel that amount around your midriff. I don't know how, how, uh, how much it distracts from the virtual environment. Uh, Henry says he thinks the first one also had something like that, right? So exactly, if you're wearing anything or there's something that is trying to move with you, anything on the skin, obviously you feel that. So there's the tactile feedback of the hardware apparatus. And in a lot of these systems, you'll notice that they are uh, implicitly trying to minimize the tactile feedback. They're trying to create the illusion that you're free and clear and moving through a virtual environment. You're not wearing any heavy, uh, any heavy materials. Okay, so with the flat plate, you get your foot collision when expected, but they, by wearing your socks, they're minimizing uh, friction, and you get back to this sensation of uh, sliding while walking, which is not, uh, not ideal. Okay, let's have a look now at the, the current front runner of uh, hardware solutions to VR, which is the InfiniDeck. Welcome to InfiniDeck, a true omnidirectional treadmill. Infinidec uses motorized components and a simple belt connected to a sensor to track and respond to your movements in real time. Infinidec's belt has multiple bands that change direction, allowing you to go in any direction at your own pace, freeing you to explore your virtual reality environment naturally and safely. Infinidec revolutionizes virtual reality movement giving you the ability to quickly change pace, stop and go, crouch and pivot, providing a truly immersive experience. With our technology, you can feel like part of your favorite game or jog through exotic countryside while at the gym. Infinidec makes the future possible today. Imagine training simulations that prepare you for urban warfare, let you practice tactics on foreign terrain, or even walk beneath the stars of another world. 
Infinidex omnidirectional treadmill technology makes it possible for you to be fully engaged in the VR world while keeping you safely in the center of the treadmill. There is no limit to where you can go. Okay, let's obviously start by talking about the treadmill, uh, the treadmill itself. How does the Infinidec allow 360 degree motion? Or how does it allow the canceling out of walking in any direction so the person returns to the center of the treadmill? Let's focus on the hardware for a moment. A traditional treadmill that you find in the gym, it cancels out forward motion because you're running uh, forward, but it does not cancel out side to side or moving backwards. How does the Infinidec allow that to happen? So as, as Henry says, there are tracks that are able to slide in two ways. If you go back and watch, you watch the details, you'll notice as Sarah says, this is an omnidirectional, uh, this is an omnidirectional treadmill. Another way of saying it is, it's a treadmill of treadmills. So there's the large treadmill, which will move in opposition to the detected direction of the human user. So it's already different from a traditional treadmill. So it's able to cancel out forward and backward motion of the user, parallel to the main axis of the treadmill. But each horizontal band or belt in the overall treadmill is itself a treadmill and the horizontal movement or the, ro the rotation, the clockwise or counterclockwise rotation of any individual belt in the large treadmill will move in the opposite direction and at, but at the same velocity as any horizontal motion. Yeah? You can go back and watch the video and see that uh, in, in, uh, in action. By doing so, it's able to overcome two of the problems that existed in the three systems we've seen so far, which is either hitting the foot early on the lip of the incline, so we get away, we can get back to a flat ground, but we can also maintain friction, the actual uh, friction cues that are coming, that are convincing your brain that you're actually moving in the opposite direction to the felt obstruction of friction. And you feel your foot being obstructed by friction, that's a signal to your body that you're moving in the opposite direction. There is a cost, however, that Infinidec pays. There is an additional uh, aspect of frustration that occurs in the Infinidec that does not occur in the other three systems by going with this particular omnidirectional treadmill solution. What is it? The Infinidec helps to create the illusion of natural motion, but it's not perfect. If you watch carefully in the video, you'll notice that the people are walking and running kind of carefully. 
Why? As Prasida mentions, even when you stop moving, it takes a second or so to stop the treadmill. So you move a little bit after you stop or change in direction, right? So if you think about it in the real world, if you're walking at a slow speed, the moment you stop moving your legs, there is an instantaneous cessation of acceleration. You immediately stop moving. In the case of the Infinidec, that is not quite true. And I can imagine, again, I haven't tried this myself, but that's, a, that's pretty disconcerting. If you've ever been on a treadmill at the gym, when the treadmill is still moving and you expect it to have already stopped because you've just turned it off, that can be a little bit uh, dis uh, disconcerting. Again, you can imagine because in natural environments, if you're moving when you think you should be still, that means you're slipping on ice or sliding on loose soil not often, not usually a good thing, uh, not, usually not, not a good thing. Okay, uh, Henry says it doesn't look like you will be able to walk backwards very well. Um, that's probably true. In theory, it should be able to support backwards motion just as much as forward motion. But imagine when you, if you're walking backwards, which for most humans is already makes you a little bit nervous because we don't have eyes in the back of our head. We're not getting visual feedback from what's behind us. And if the ground is also moving under us, not quite in phase with, with our motion. You can imagine that's probably dub, doubly upsetting. Okay. Sarah says they need to make sure that the users don't move off center. You might be able to fall off if not made well. Yeah, exactly. So I, you can, if you watch these videos, and there's a more recent video from this year of an updated version of the Infinidec, it's, cl it's close but not perfect. So like heads-up display, heads-up displays where they've been working on trying to reduce the time lag between head motion and visual repercussion. They're trying to do the same thing with the Infinidec. Reduce time lag between physical motion or body motion and tactile or acceleration uh, feedback. Okay. Uh, and Henry says the pole doesn't look very very durable. Yeah, that, that's that's true. Okay. Okay, we'll look at we'll look at the last system here, uh, the rover system. Okay, I think you get the get the idea. Obviously, it's a much simpler system, much more low cost. What are some of the the drawbacks of this low cost system? Main benefit clearly being that it's low cost, simpler. You might have noticed the user was shuffling their feet and wasn't actually taking their feet off the ground, right? So un, as Matthew mentions, unnatural movement here while, while walking, okay. Uh, although because it's simpler, there are also fewer body connections uh, physically tethering to the technology, so less, less occlusion here. Okay, so obviously this technology is, is progressing. It's not quite there yet, but getting, getting pretty close. Uh, Nolan says, which would, uh, also makes it seem like it would be hard to distinguish between forward and backward motion. Yeah, agreed, agreed. Okay, so that's, uh, that's body motion. Let's focus on now on heads-up display. This is something that uh, people have been working on for decades in virtual reality. Very difficult to get right. One, one difficulty here is, again, this issue of uh, time lag, so motion of the head and resulting flow of the visual field. That's just a matter of faster and faster uh, technology. That's basically solved at the moment. Another challenge has to do with the fact that when you're looking through a heads-up display, your eyes are actually focusing on two separate screens, as you can see here, that are very close to the eyes. The real left and right screen are not physically, they are not physically overlapping. So the left eye sees everything in the left screen and the left eye sees nothing that is projected on the right screen. 
The right eye sees everything that is projected on the right screen in a heads-up display and nothing that is projected onto the left screen. In reality, however, that is not true. Um, whatever it is that you're looking at in the real world, as long as it's more than three inches beyond the bridge of your nose, you are, your uh, two eyes are seeing uh, par parts of the visual field are being detected only by one eye. The, those parts of the visual scene that you're looking at that are to the far left and the far right respectively. But the majority of material in your visual scene is being seen by both your eyes but at a slightly different angle. You're getting slight, two slightly different views on all the objects near the center of your visual field, which is why you're able to see in 3D. The fact that you're seeing the same objects, but seeing them slightly differently, is what gives you the sensation of, of depth. So there's been a lot of uh, computer graphics, uh, computer, computer graphics and computational geometry work to figure out how to actually generate the uh, generate the scene for the left physical eye, physical screen, and the right physical screen. When you get this right, the, uh, when you get this right, if you're actually observing the eyes of the person wearing the heads-up display very carefully, you will notice that they are actually not focusing their gaze on the screens themselves. They are focusing their, uh, they are focusing their gaze very far uh, beyond the, the visual screen, the, the screen, the screens themselves, which means they are combining these, this visual information at a further distance uh, than the visual screens themselves. This has to do with the physiology of the human eye. Uh, and whenever you're saccading around a 3D environment, you are altering the virgins and the accommodation of your eyes. Let's start with vergence. Vergence ba basically means the horizontal angle of your eyes, so the angles of your eyes. If you're looking at a scene that is close to you, uh, you have high convergence. Your eyes are looking uh, inward. If you are looking at a scene that is further away, or if you look at a close scene and then look at a further scene, your eyes diverge and they uh, become more parallel. So convergence and divergence, those two mechanisms, there are muscles in your eyes that are pulling them towards one another and away from one another, that's vergence. There is also accommodation, which are muscles that are pulling on uh, the lens of your eyes to narrow or bunch the lens, basically change the shape of the lens of your eyes so that you can focus on objects that are further or closer away from you. In physical reality, you are usually performing virgins and accommodation together. So as you're pulling, uh, you're, if you're looking at something that is closer in, you are converging and accommodating. When you then look at something that is further away, you are diverging and accommodating or altering your lens in another way. It is possible, however, to project uh, it is possible to project virtual scenes that cause the eyes to diverge and focus on something be quote unquote beyond the physical scene. And that is best illustrated by audio stereograms. Um, I've done this before once with people on a Zoom call. I think you should be able to do this. Um, some people are able to do this better than others. Um, as you're listening to my, my voice, have a look at the audio stereogram here, and I want you to relax your eyes. What that means is, as you're relaxing your eyes, there are a few visual cues, there are many visual cues that are hidden in this audio stereogram that suggest to your brain that you should uh, diverge. Instead of uh, turning your eyes inward and looking at the, the screen, so for those of you that are looking at a laptop or a desktop, the physical screen is probably about a foot or less away from your eyes, maybe a foot or two. But there are little cues in here that are suggesting that there is something else to be seen here if you look beyond or into the screen and beyond the screen. If you diverge and focus your gaze uh, two feet or three feet away from you, and there are also hints here that will help you accommodate or reshape the shape of your lens in your eyes to see the pattern that is behind the physical scene, behind the physical screen. 
Um, raise your hand if you can see what's behind the audio stereogram here. Cole can, Bryce can, two people. It's not so easy. When you see, when you see the illusion, you'll notice that your eyes are relaxing and relax. They're actually, you can feel them um, becoming more parallel, diverging compared to looking at the physical sc screen. For those that are able to see what's behind the audio stereogram, what is it? What's behind the audio stereogram? There's another giant eye back there. Okay. Uh, for some people, this makes them feel cross-eyed. Uh, if you have time, you can have a look at this at your at your leisure. So, um, uh, vi vi uh, vi video streams that are computed and projected onto the vis physical screens in a heads-up display, they are not quite an audio stereogram, but kind of the same thing. They're providing hints um, that cause your eyes to converge or diverge and, and accommodate the lens in a particular way. So that a lot of people, initially when they put on a heads-up display, they kind of see two, image two flat 2D images, but eventually Though they melt into one 3D image. Okay, not so easy to get it right, but uh, um, Oculus Rifts, I think, is the main company that's that's made the most progress on how to compute the right images for real screens to convince the brain that it is seeing a single unified scene further away. Okay, so um, that's sort of the hardware side. We're going to switch now and talk about sort of the software side or the more HCI uh, aspects of virtuality or virtual reality. Um, obviously, virtual reality has been around for a long time. It's kind of hard to distinguish between computer games and virtual reality. Um, you can, or I trace it all the way back to the 1970s with the MUDs or the first multi-user uh, dungeons where there was no graphics. And the virtual scene was constructed by the human uh, observer's imagination. This is obviously something we've had for a long time. You can read a story or listen to a story and create a virtual scene in your head. Virtual reality is trying to take that burden off the human observer and do it for them. Obviously, there are pros and cons uh, to this. But again, throughout uh, storytelling going back thousands of years up through the 1970s to multi-user dungeons, the idea has been to present certain information. It could be visual or auditory information in the form of words making up a story. And that raw material allows the brain to construct uh, construct a scene or an idea that is slightly different or is very different from physical reality. Okay, we're going to spend uh, a few minutes now, we'll probably continue this discussion next time about what are some of the application areas for virtual reality. Obviously, uh, entertainment, computer games are, are the most obvious and probably going to be the most lucrative for uh, for a long time to come. However, there are a lot of uh, HCI labs uh, throughout the world that are looking at trying to apply emerging uh, VR systems to help within other uh, other human uh, domains. One of them is education. We're going to spend some time talking about this. What would be the point of trying to educate a student or a group of students in a virtual uh, reality? compared to a classroom or the next best thing, which is a Microsoft Teams meeting. I'm going to show you a short video here um, that is attempting to create some VR technology uh, for a nursing program. As you watch this video, I want you to pay attention to the fact that one of the challenges about uh, training to be an effective nurse is not just medical knowledge, but also being aware of the social situation or the cultural context attendant on, uh, on uh, human patients. We've been wanting to do virtual reality here at IEPUC for a lot of reasons, but um, you know, flexibility being one of them. So the equipment is uh, SimX AR. So it is a company out of California that does virtual reality. Uh, 
programming for health professions. It's very accurate because I work in a hospital and like when we have C. diff patients, like the isolation, you have to practice putting on the gown, the gloves, washing the hands properly. If my test results come back, I, I have all this diarrhea. Well, you actually have a condition that's called C. diff, so it actually makes you have diarrhea up there for a while. I like the aspect that you're communicating with the patient and the family members because that's that's real life. So what medications were you on during the pregnancy? I used pills about a week ago. What pills were they? Do you know the exact name of the medication? I'd not say. Oh, okay. I take pain medication. Unfortunately, we do see commonly, and a lot across the country we do, but we do see a lot of it here in our region. And so that is babies born to a mother that um, took various types of drugs and might have some withdrawal symptoms. The purpose of that scenario is not so much around the baby, but more around the mother and how they talk with the mother. I feel terrible. I'm sorry you feel that way. The only part we're concerned about is her fussiness and stuff, so we're just going to have to monitor her through the withdrawal stages and make sure everything stays on track, but as far as we're concerned, she looks like a healthy baby. Well, actual clinical exposure, live clinical exposure is fantastic. We can't create uh, a situation, so that is the, the big value is the flexibility. UIT has really got this off the ground for us, so um, Bill Fields, our executive director, was... Um, Okay, so nursing is, is yet one, uh, one of many human domains where uh, the practitioner, the student, is wrestling with the technical or professional aspects uh, of the job, in this case the medical side uh, of nursing, but also the social and cultural context here. I don't know whether it came through in the audio, but dealing with uh, mothers that, um, uh, that have substance abuse issues that are affecting the child. If you're in the same room as the mother and the child and you're the nurse trying to provide professional care and medical care, how do you, how do you handle these two aspects of your job simultaneously? It is easy to describe it in theory, but to give them the in-person experience of what that's like, that is again obviously difficult. So a good midpoint might be a virtual reality system where from the nurse's point of view, they feel that they are immersed alone in the room with the mother and the child, and it is up to them to handle and navigate uh, that situation. Okay, we'll look at, uh, we'll look at a different uh, uh, area of application for virtual reality for education, which is uh, trying to create VR that scaffolds spatial cognition. So in this program, we can see a virtual cadaver in front of us, and we can manipulate that cadaver such that we can look from any direction at any structure. We're part of a larger university-wide virtual reality initiative, and this is just one of Colorado State University's commitments to providing an education that is second to none. So I can grab any structure, I can remove it, I can manipulate it, I can look at it from any direction. We were looking into ways that we could use technology to try to improve our anatomy curriculum. Anatomy is essentially a um, very spatial exercise, understanding how parts uh, sit in relation to each other, how those parts interact, and the ability to display that in three dimensions and give someone the ability to interact with it uh, is can really advance how far a student can get into the material and how well they pick it up. Third ventricle is super, super helpful. So you see these structures in the lab, but a lot of time you can't get deep enough to be able to see those intricacies. And when you put it in virtual reality, you're able to take away those layers one by one and actually invest in these structures and see what they look like. And then you can see it, like it leaves this gray plane in the brain. So I think it's a lot more immediate learning. I don't think that a student has to spend as much time looking at the cross-sectional anatomy and picturing where these tracks are going, they can just put the headset on and see it immediately. Students have been integral in this project, getting into it and identifying things that would work better if changed. To be able to come in here and say, okay, this is what I would like to see, this is what I think would be super helpful, um, to be able to actually see that come to fruition is really cool. Developing the program in-house allows us to tailor this program to our curriculum in anatomy and neuroanatomy rather than bending that already successful and existing curriculum around a particular computer program. Okay, I'm going to pause the video here. You notice that uh, both observers are looking at a common virtual structure here, the human brain. 
Presumably, given their, uh, their relative positions and orientations to the virtual brain here, they have different views on this object. Not quite sure what it is that they're seeing in their heads-up display, but there might be interesting uh, opportunities here for joint attention. So the instructor is maybe through the way that they look or manipulate the virtual brain, drawing the attention of the student to a particular anatomical substructure in the brain. You could, of course, sit down and make a very fancy computer graphic, interactive computer graphics application uh, for anatomy as well, where with uh, keyboard and mouse, uh, the, the uh, instructor or student can click on an anatomical substructure and move it and rotate it. What might be the advantage of creating the illusion that the anatomical structure is there with you and you can reach out and grasp and manipulate and pull out and rotate objects using these, uh, using these handheld devices? Is there? Is there an advantage here to being able to phys physically manipulate anatomical structures with your hands, reach in, pull out, and rotate? than the equivalent actions using a keyboard and mouse in a laptop or desktop application. How might the additional VR dynamics here <coughs> help with learning, the anat learning anatomy? More intuitive, right? So obviously manipulating complex objects, we have a lot of experience of doing that with our hands. Does that increased in intuition, that make that simpler uh, manipulation, does that perhaps give you, does that, does that provide a leg up, no pun intended, on learning human anatomy? Priscilla mentions you can get a sense of scale. Yeah, that's an interesting idea. Remember all the way back to the beginning of the course where we, we we tried to focus as HCI designers on helping the user do what they want to do, which in this case is learn human anatomy, and instead of focusing on what the technology can do. And that, that, latter, um, that latter dynamic is particularly um, attractive in VR. It's easy to get distracted with the bells and whistles of VR and create something that actually distracts the user away from what they're trying to do, which is learn human anatomy. What do you think here? Is there does it, a system like this, would this actually help with learning uh, human anatomy? Is the very sense that it's intuitive, as Joseph mentions, is that enough to make learning a little bit easier here? Most of you have had the experience in biology class of, of looking at uh, 2D slices through a three-dimensional organism. And by looking at those slices, you ha you're forced to mentally try and reconstruct those slices back into a three-dimensional object and understand how all the pieces put, uh, are put together. So there is an additional cognitive burden aside from just memorization, a big part of tackling biology and anatomy and biochemistry is there's just simply a lot of details to memorize. That's already a challenge. If you have this additional challenge of trying to indirectly rotate objects uh, in your head, you're trying to perform spatial cognition, which is a, a challenging thing to do. Maybe making the system more intuitive just reduces that cognitive load and allows you to focus more on memorization. We could try and answer this question uh, Khan says using VR helps you in clinical practice more than looking at pictures or using keyboards. Possibly. Again, we could add a question mark to the end of Khan's statement here and turn it into a hypothesis. Does it? And if so, why does VR help with clinical practice or training, clinical training, more than looking at pictures or using a keyboard? Yeah. If we understand those underlying reasons, we can emphasize those aspects in our VR system and, uh, uh, and focus on that rather than, again, what the VR system can do. Okay. So uh, in the last few minutes here, we're going to look at uh, we're going to look at a few figures that I extracted from a survey paper about uh, a survey paper about virtual reality and education. 
Um, this is a review paper, and in a review paper, as the name implies, they're usually reviewing a lot of other papers that are out there in the virtual reality literature. Um, in this case, I think they looked at 90 or 100 papers that had actually looked at using VR in clinical domains, like Khan mentioned here, uh, and other uh, various educational domains. And in each of those 100 papers, they're looking for particular keywords to try and understand how those VR systems were applied in those different domains. Um, I've duplicated figure five from the paper here um, just because they've written some of the text horizontally and some of it vertically. So uh, on the horizontal axis here, they've looked at various uh, applications like simulation training. So, so simulating something uh, rather than having to read about it in theory or look at it in a textbook, can you actually bring it to life in a simulation? We just looked at applications for training. So actually putting the student or the practitioner into the environment that they're going to have to uh, that they're going to have to uh, operate in in a professional setting. Um, looking at VR for uh, people that have uh, access limited resources. So they're at a distance from whatever it is they want to they want to work on. Perhaps they're learning. Uh, perhaps they're learning to work uh, with a complex uh, machine or an expensive machine, not everyone can use it all the time. Uh, they're at, they're, they only have limited access to that device. Can we supplement that with VR? And obviously distance, uh, distance learning. If we can't all be in the same place, maybe we can all put on our heads up display and create the illusion that we're all in the same place at the same time. Okay, motivations. Why would you want to use VR in a particular application? What, what are the actual advantages? Uh, these papers that they surveyed uh, mentioned constructivism. So in a lot of VR applications, what the student is trying to learn is how to make or build or construct or fix something. That is obviously something that is difficult to do just theoretically. You need hands-on practice in those kinds of domains. Again, if the device that you're building or fixing or maintaining uh, is, uh, you have limited access to it, maybe VR could be helpful here. What about collaborative situations? So in the in nursing example we just saw, it might be the nurse and a doctor uh, and the mother and the child and possibly the father all in the same room. There is a lot of, there's a lot of social interactions going on. What happens if we are trying to train a student or a practitioner to carry out some professional duties in which it requires many people pulling in the same direction to get the job done? And again, what happens if everyone is uh, separated can we bring everybody together uh, so that they, there is the sense that they are collectively operating on the same object or interacting with the same set of people uh, at the same time? Okay, some other pedagogical factors. So some other things that may help with uh, may help with the educational process is gamifying the system itself. Most of you hopefully are gaining some practice with that uh, over the next few weeks. Um, learning can often be a drag. Simply making it fun may help. Uh, and then some of the papers mentioned other pedagogical practices as well. Okay, some other motivations, some other reasons why you might want to use uh, VR are simply intrinsic factors. So things that are just intrinsic to the system uh, as a whole. The, mo the most popular uh, feature of intrinsic motivation that was mentioned is increased immersion. You, you, the users of this VR system, while they are trying to learn something that is difficult or boring, they reported that they just felt that they were in the system. In the VR treadmill and the other systems we looked at at the beginning of today's lecture, uh, at one point one of the demonstrators mentioned breaking the immersive experience, right? It, when VR works, the physical world fades away and you feel that you are in the system. This is an important non-functional uh, non requirement of HCI, which we talked about towards the beginning of the course, which is this feature of engagement, how engaging is a given system? How much does it feel as if it draws the user in? That is a very subjective uh, requirement and one of the most difficult uh, features of a system to measure. You can measure utility and accessibility uh, and how well it teaches someone ASL. Those things are much more easily quantifiable during user testing. 
But quantifying immersion or engagement is much, much more difficult. Um, and if you get it right, is often um, one of the most important things you can do in an HCI system. If you can engage someone and pull them out of their normal circumstances, get remove all of the distractions of the physical world and allow them to focus on learning or performing a difficult task with others, that's, that would be the payoff of all, the, uh, all of the challenges and difficulties associated with VR. Okay, some of the others here are kind of, kind of obvious. Okay, I think we will pause there for today. Uh, just a reminder, the quiz from last Thursday, uh, a student pointed out that because of Blackboard's formatting, uh, because of the formatting, it was often difficult to tell which, uh, which answer option went with which question. So you'll notice that I've zeroed out everybody's answer and I've also zeroed out the weight of Thursday's quiz. So Thursday's quiz is not gonna count towards your final grade quiz today. Will, you have a quiz due tonight. You're working on weekly report uh, number two. For those of you that are traveling this week, uh, I wish you uh, safety and uh, I wish you all the best. Uh, I know this is a stressful time of year. Um, I hope you find uh, a few, uh, some time to rest and relax. Uh, and then we will be back next week for the last week of classes. And I will see you then next Tuesday. Thanks very much, everyone. Happy Thanksgiving. Bye-bye.